Okay, there we go. Cool. Hello, traders. Welcome to another episode of the Tradefluence podcast. I'm your host, Peter. And today with me is Nick Lucas of Exquisite Timepieces. Welcome to the show, Nick. Cool. Yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, full disclosure, Nick and I have known each other for a long time. I've been buying watches from Nick for years. He's probably the person I trust the most in this space. He's also a watch expert. So I want to get a little background from you, Nick. Um, how did you get into the watch space? What got you excited about watches to begin with? So I think a lot of it kind of goes to the mechanical aspect. You know, I'm big into watches and cars, two very mechanical things. Um, and I started getting into it in high school. Uh, and when I moved down here from Maryland, uh, I moved down to Naples, Florida about four years ago. Um, I was shopping for my first luxury watch and I ran into exquisite timepieces and I realized, wow, this place is only a few minutes from my house. Um, so I ended up coming in. I made friends with the, the management, the owners, um, and everything just really kind of fit in together. So I started working at the store and I started selling watches when I was just 17 years old. Um, and, and the passion has just kind of grown from there. You know, I've been into it for a while, but it doesn't really feel like work. You know, I always am trying to learn. Um, and it's just, it's really cool being a part of that industry. Yeah. And you've been really successful at it too, obviously. I mean, you're selling a lot of watches and you guys have some pretty cool brands at Exquisite as well. Uh, what's your favorite brand right now? What's the one that you're most excited about? That's a tough one. Um, there are a ton of really good brands that we carry and brands that we don't carry as well. Um, I think my, the brand that I'm most excited about is probably Glasuta, um, Glasuta Regional. Uh, that is my go-to brand. I think they're the best watches you can get for the money. Incredible quality. Reliability is just insane. Um, and it's also one of those brands that not everybody knows about unless you're into watches. So it's cool if you're ever in public and you know about them and you see somebody wearing them, you know that that's another watch enthusiast. You know, it's not like Rolex Submariners where you see them just everywhere you go. You know, it's just something different. Uh, and their new releases have been awesome. Uh, like we were just chatting about the uh, the new turquoise and the orange dials and you know, they're just going crazy. Yeah, I mean, that's one I, I've had my eye on. I know you recommended that brand to me a couple of years ago. I bought one. I love that watch. It was a great watch. Um, and now the new ones are just off the charts. But, you know, like most watches, you know, they may be an investment, they may not. Is Glassuit a brand that you would say, hey, that's probably an investment depending on the piece you get? Or is that one that you say, hey, it's just, it's always going to go up great no matter what? What do you think about Glassuit as a brand from an investment perspective? It totally depends, you know, from watch to watch. Um, depends on if you buy it new versus pre-owned, and, and it really depends on the specific model. Um, so, for example, five years ago, you know, they really had no place on the map. Nobody knew what they were. Uh, I didn't even know what they were. We would sell like one per month uh, on average. And now a lot of their watches are back ordered to the point where we have to wait several months for them. Uh, for example, the the new like uh, the CQ collection, the green dial, the new one, um, that watch is back ordered for like three months. We can't even get them in stock. Wow. So so some of the, the pieces like that that are more popular, more back ordered, I mean, those definitely have potential to be worth, you know, higher than uh, the retail pricing. Uh, and also their limited edition pieces too. Uh, it, it seems like a lot of those go uh, go way up in value. Um, wow. Every year they do like the 70s collection, like the ones that they just came out with. Uh, it seems like those always sell out in just seconds because they only do 100 of them. Uh, and then they're, they're trading for way over MSRP. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I've been into watches for, for a long time. And one of the things that always struck me is I was like, there's two types of watch buyers, right? There's the people that buy just because they love the watch and they could care less whether it goes up in value because they're going to keep it regard regardless. And then there are people that buy watches for investments. And, you know, in this segment, I think we'll probably talk more about people who are buying watches for investments. And you mentioned a couple of things with that suit that I think are really critical. You know, um, when you look at a watch as an investment, would you say that rarity is one of the driving factors in, in longer term value? Or what are the things that you say really matter if you're going to invest in a luxury watch? There's many like different factors that go into it, um, because just just because a watch is rare doesn't mean it's going to be worth a lot of money. Uh, demand, I think, is the key factor. Um, you know, I'd mentioned the, the Rolex Submariner earlier, just as an example. Mm -hmm. That's a watch. I mean, Rolex produces an insane amount of watches. Um, the figures that everybody goes by are over a million watches per year, you know, close to 1.5 million watches per year. 
but all their sport watches, the steel sport watches are all selling for above MSRP. You know, it's not that those watches are rare. It's just the demand is way above the supply of the watches. Um, so demand, I think, is the, the driving factor. Um, but rarity can add a lot of value as well. Uh, for example, like Chopek, you know, one of the, uh, the independent brands that we carry, those watches, they only produce right now, I believe, about 500 watches per year. Um, so very rare in comparison to a lot of other companies, but also the demand is there too, because they're beautiful watches. Um, so the the base model, like Chopek, Antarctique, the very basic, just black dial, white dial, uh, they're selling for you know $30,000, $35,000, and that's a $20,000 watch. Um, but there's also those brands where they might make five of a watch, so only five for the entire world, but it might be ugly or, you know, just nobody wants it. So yeah, yeah it's in value. Um, yeah. So there, there's a lot of examples of that too. So rarity is not the only factor. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, brand recognition can be another factor as well. Um, but there's really a lot that goes into, you know, pieces that are going up in price. Um, I, I think recognition is a big part. You know, there's some watches, if there's only five of them and nobody knows about it then there's no market for it there's no demand for it yeah i mean it seems like over the last couple of years we've seen some new brands come out that i think you know i mean you pointed me in the direction of jorn originally and that's a great example of one that's just skyrocketed in value i went to the boutique in miami and they told me the wait list is three years long to get a new one so i mean to your point of saying hey it matters whether or not there's demand and now there's brand recognition and oh by the way they're all very rare so that's sort of the trifecta and that's just shot up in value what mm -hmm. is the most expensive watch that you've ever sold the rarest watch you've ever sold give us some examples of some cool things that you guys have sold over at exquisite so the most expensive watch that the store has sold this was before i was there uh it was a, a frank mueller uh it was the uh it was the mega uh Eternius, i believe it was called it was 2.7 million dollars that was it's the still to date i believe it's the most complicated wristwatch ever sold they only made eight of them and it was very bespoke so everyone was different uh the one that our client created was all factory set baguette cut rubies all over it uh it had 36 complications platinum case platinum buckle with baguette rubies on the buckle um i mean it's years and years and years of development um, so yeah, it was two point seven million dollars for that watch. Wow, so that's the most expensive one that our store has ever sold. Uh, personally, the most expensive one I've ever sold was the Tiffany and Co. stamped uh, Patek Philippe Nautilus fifty seven eleven blue dial, unworn. Uh, we sold that one for two hundred fifty five thousand. But you know, as I'm sure you saw, the the Patek market was all over the place over the past year. So we sold that watch about a year ago. It was probably worth about four fifty five hundred thousand dollars at its peak, um, just because that's one that everybody knows about. It. It's a paddock. It's a Nautilus. It's stainless steel, blue dial. It's everything that everybody wants. And then the Tiffany and Co. stamp just added even more to it. So the the <laughs> demand on that one is absolutely insane. And they only make so many of the Tiffany dials every year. So that's a perfect example to your point of hey, you know, it's already a, a a really well-recognized watch, right? Everybody knows 5711. If you like watches, you know watches. You know, you can't really go wrong with a Nautilus. Uh, and then to have a Tiffany stamp dial, how many of those do they make a year? Like 15, 20, 100? Do, we, do you have an idea? They don't really say how many they make per year. Um, if I were to guess, this is, again, this is just ballpark estimate. I don't think there are any official figures out there. If I were to guess, I would say probably around 15 per year of that specific watch. Okay. However, since then that has been discontinued. So now it's impossible to get, you can't get a new one. Um, but I, original MSRP was in the $40,000 range on that watch. So for it to be trading for that much over retail is just absolutely mine. Yeah, I mean, you said at its peak 400,000, so it's trading 10 <laughs> times retail. So mm -hmm. somebody, you know, if you were able to sell at the peak, you made quite a killing, even if you didn't, that watch will probably climb in value for years to come because to your point now it's been discontinued and these things pop when they get discontinued if they have all those traits that you're talking about rare mm -hmm. they have the brand recognition you know they look nice so they're kind of popular at that moment 
Um, what is what's your your absolute uh, favorite watch that you've ever seen come through the store? Give me some examples of some watches that you've really enjoyed handling that you've sold, and maybe some that you think are undervalued at the moment that you think, hey, this is a great watch. It's a great buy. It's it's something you're going to enjoy and possibly you know could go up in value over the long term. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, gosh, I might have to think on that one for a second. In terms of like favorite watch, yeah. there's so many good ones that have come through the stores, so many that I'm just like in love with. Um, God, where do I even start? Actually, what about the Grand Seiko. I know you're a big Grand Seiko fan. Grand Seiko makes some beautiful watches. Um, they're the movements are absolutely incredible. Um, and that's one of those brands. It's it's similar to Glassuta in the the aspect of if you're not into watches, then you you probably have no idea what they are, you know. But if you're into watches, you know that the the mechanical aspect, the movements are just absolutely incredible. The finishing is incredible. Um, but again, if if you don't know watches, then a lot of people are like, oh, it's a Seiko. Like my grandfather had one of those, you know. Right. So there's there's a big like misconception that Seiko is Grand Seiko. Um, so I've had plenty of Grand Seikos that I love uh chopek same thing i think chopek may be the the antarctique may be one of my favorite watches of all time um okay. that's definitely up there and that's one of those that's trading for way over msrp they completely closed the order books uh for the next year so you can't even order one from anybody until 2023 um so the order books are backed up like crazy you know, so that's one that's kind of like the the Nautilus and the Royal Oaks and all that. It's just going for crazy money, impossible to get for retail. Um, yeah. But in terms, of, in terms of favorite, that's a tough one. I mean, I, it's like choosing your favorite child, right? I know yeah. that because you know how frequently I trade watches and go for different things. I've got a favorite one month, and the next month I'm like, hey, well, I'm going to sell that one. I'll get a different one. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's interesting that you point that out because there are so many watches that I bought. I purchased over the years and some that I just I love the way they look so I bought them you know Arnold and Son that you know that beautiful perpetual moon phase calendar mm -hmm. or the, the world timer all those different watches have been great and those are ones that suffer from not enough brand recognition so don't quite hold mm -hmm. their value very well but on the flip side of that Shopik is one to your point that you know has sort of had that come up like Jorn not to the same extent but now it's gotten really popular and hard to get and uh, you know two years ago anybody could get one for pretty much retail right exactly yeah they, they used to come in um now everything that comes in is pre-sold we don't even have display for them in our store anymore because we don't have any chop x in stock brand new um so it, it would just be an empty display um yeah now everything that comes in is pre-sold already and it used to be totally different you know three two three years ago nobody knew what they were it was just like jorn um, and then they just started catching on. They released a steel sport watch and just, you know, snowball effect. Everything just started going crazy with them. Um, the prices just went nuts. So if somebody's looking to buy a watch today and they say, you know, hey, they call you up, Nick, I want to buy a watch. You know, I'm looking for, let's say, you know, they don't give you any specifics. Maybe it's a steel sport watch. Maybe it's a dress watch, whatever it is. And I don't want to lose money on it. Maybe I want to make some money on it. I want to treat it like an investment. What brand would you recommend or what watch would you recommend? Would it be a Glassute? Would it be a Chopic? What would you say, hey, this is the brand to go with? So I guess it kind of depends on how far into the future you're thinking about letting go of it. You know, if it's something that, that you want to buy and enjoy for however long, and then you know that you're going to be safe when you get rid of it. Um, we don't carry them. So as much as it pains me to say it, Rolex is always one of those brands where it seems like the prices are, are pretty stable. Um, you know, you, you buy a Submariner, say right now they're going for $14,000. I don't see that watch ever going back under retail, you know, so $10,000 is, in my opinion, that's probably gonna be like the floor if the market pulls back hard. Um, it's just one of those watches, it's a classic. And same with the, the GMT Masters and, you know, the Daytonas, I don't see those ever going under MSRP again. So if you have the opportunity to pick one up for MSRP uh, and that is something that you want to enjoy and you don't want to worry about, I'd say that that's like a safe buy. Um, but then there's also those brands that are a little bit like of a curveball, you know, like um, H. Moser, um, like Chopek, Laurent Ferrier, um, some of those other brands, 
they have potential to like skyrocket in price just like fp Jorn um did just you know over the past couple of years so those are kind of the the more of like a gamble type of watch um so you're not exactly like guaranteed you're never guaranteed to get your money back or to make money on anything um but those are the watches that are a little bit more of a gamble but i think they have a lot more potential to go up you know a submariner trading for fourteen thousand dollars right now for example I don't see that ever being a, a 25, 30, 40,000 dollar watch. Whereas, you know, if you look at some of the, the really low production watches from some of those companies I just named, they very well may trade for two times, three times, four times retail at some point in the future. Right. I mean, so you're I mean, that's a great that's a great call out, right? Um, you know, when we think about these these rarer brands, the Chopics of the world, H Moser, Laurent Ferrier, they're a bit more like the penny stocks. You may not know that company. You know, but they maybe they're going to shoot up and you could, you know, double, triple to your point. You have no idea. I mean, the guys that bought Jorns and had a lot of them and have sold them have made a killing. Um, mm -hmm. And who would have thought, you know, I know six years ago, you know, five, six years ago, you could buy uh, a Nautilus in a store sometimes, but you could always, always pick up an Aquanaut easily. Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes even below retail. And now look at what's happened with those prices on Patek. So, you know, to your point, hey, it's kind of a gamble. Whereas Rolex is like putting your money in an index fund and just watching it sort of, mm -hmm. hey, it's going to hold its value. It's not going to go anywhere. It's pretty safe, pretty stable. Um, would you say Omega is sort of another one of those? It's pretty stable. You know, Tudor is another one's pretty stable. Some of those more basic brands, uh, obviously Rolex makes Tudor, so kind of very similar there. But those are pretty safe, lower end brands. Exactly. Yeah. Over the past several years now, you know, Omega, Tudor, uh, brands like that have been a lot more stable, a lot more than they used to be. Um, they're they're trading for a lot closer to the original MSRP. You know, there there used to be days where they'd sell for just pennies on the dollar, uh, but that's changed a lot, and I don't really see that changing, um, especially when the market, the watch market, peaked and then pulled back. You know, over the past year, two years. Omega is one of those brands that didn't really change much. Um, like for example, the, the Seamasters and the Speedmasters, the real basic collections, they really didn't change like at all on the secondary market. So the Seamasters have always been around like that four thousand dollar price point, like steel um, for the pre-owned, just right around four thousand. They didn't skyrocket and they didn't tank. You know, when the market's going up and down, so that that's a very like stable brand as well. Yeah, you know, I'm a big Panerai fan, and I think they're mm -hmm. kind of similar. It used to be able to pick up used Panerais for pretty cheap. Pennies um, on the dollar, yeah. Yeah, and now they're kind of holding their value a little bit better. And, you know, this is, again, a perfect example of, uh, you know, sometimes you buy a watch for an investment, other times you buy a watch just because you, cause you mm -hmm. love the way it looks, right? Uh, and I think, you know, you kind of have to weigh those two things together. Um, have you ever flipped watches yourself? Have you ever bought a watch just to sell it? Or, or generally speaking, are most of the people you're selling to or that you're buying yourself, you're buying because you just love the watch? Yeah, so I've never bought a watch with the intention to flip it. Um, so I have made money on several of the, the watches that I have purchased and then sold, um, but it's never my intention just to buy a watch in order to make money on it. Uh, I, I love representing brands that we carry you know, I, I always wear my Glasuta, my Omegas, Grand Seikos, um, because that, that's where I make the money. You know, when I'm wearing a brand, when I'm representing it and people look at my wrist and they say, oh, that's a really nice watch. What is that? Do you guys sell that here? Um, it's nice to be able to sell those. So that's where I make the money in watches. I don't actively go out and try to flip watches. Um, I'd kind of see myself as like a competitor to our store as well mm -hmm. in that aspect. Um, so I, I don't really do that. I do know people that do that. And I do know people that are very successful at that. Um, and I'm sure I would be able to do that if I really tried, but again, that that's not really my goal. I always right. buy watches that I just love. Um, and, and I do weigh the fact that, you know, okay, I'm probably not going to buy this watch because I know it's going to tank in value. You know, I, I do have that in my head as well. So there is a balance between buying what I like and what I love and, and buying what I think is going to hold value. Um, yeah. And I, I think you're spot on, right? I mean, I, you know, I've gotten lucky with a couple of watches, you know, got lucky with a 5711 and got lucky with a, uh, a, a very rare, you know, AP and some other cool watches over the years, but I've also had some, some watches where I just got hosed on them, you know, and, 
And unfortunately for, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately for me, I, I never really bought a watch to your point to make any money on it. So the times I've made money, it's been great. The times mm-hmm. I've lost money, I've been like, ouch, that hurts. But it's never dampened my love of collecting. But I will say this to anybody that's watching, anybody who's interested in getting into collecting watches or starting to build a collection or investing in watches, the best thing that you can do is to call Nick or someone like Nick and talk to them as you start to buy watches because they're going to expose you to brands and things you wouldn't otherwise expect. And they're also going to help guide you through the buying process based on what you know. I was in the store not two weeks ago and Nick knows what I like, showed me a couple watches. We grabbed one right off the shelf and walked out of there with a watch that I absolutely love and a brand I never would have explored on my own. So it's worth it to find an AD, particularly a store like Exquisite because you guys carry what? I don't know how many brands. We're over 60 brands now. Over 60 brands. Yeah. So you guys have quite a bit of exposure. What's your biggest, what brand sells the most in the store? What's the most popular brand? Our top three brands, uh, I don't know one, two, three, you know, in that order, but our top three are Omega, Hublot, and Grand Seiko. Uh, we, we sell them all like absolutely crazy. Um, Grand Seiko, you know, that's a brand five years ago. Nobody knew what they were. But now the, the watch enthusiast community has just accepted them and has been loving them. Um, and, and it's starting to become a little more mainstream. You know, if you walk out onto the streets, you're still not going to get people like, hey, is that a Grand Seiko? You know, very often. Um, but they are building a lot more of a name for themselves. Uh, and, and we sell them like crazy. Same thing with Omega. You know, Omega has always been one of the key players in the watch industry. Uh, and, and we've been selling those guys like crazy. And then Hublot as well. So a lot of Hublots right now are backordered for months, if not sometimes really? years. Um, the, the Big Bang Unicos we've received, they, they just came out with uh, new models. Like uh, this was like, gosh, I think it was last year. Um, they came out the new Unico models and we just received our first one two weeks ago. Um, so those have been backordered forever. It's probably going to be months before we see another one. Same thing with the Spirit of Big Bangs. Spirit of Big Bangs, I don't think I've seen one come in in six months. So they're they're on fire right now too. What do you think it is? I mean, you know, Hublot is a particularly divisive brand. People either love it or they hate it, you know, and I know where I fall in that category, but I think uh, some of the watches they make are really quite interesting and pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's because they sort of come from that fashion watch background, that sort of uh, quartz background that people sort of have written them off despite the sort of resurgence and their, you know, I would say relatively cool uh, watches over the last several years? A hundred percent. So not only quartz, but I think also the uh, original Big Bang collection uh, and then even some of their other like current collections as well. Um, They use pretty basic movements and a lot of watch enthusiasts are all about the movements, all about the mechanical aspect. Um, So basically, you know, everybody's saying, oh, they're overpriced. They're not worth it. Um, But they don't realize that in a lot of their new collections, they're actually using really good, fully in-house movements, um, just incredible watches, and the materials they use are awesome. They're doing forged carbon fiber with colors integrated into it, uh, ceramic, like they're doing all these different colors of ceramic. Um, they're doing some really cool materials, and now they really are using great movements in a lot of the collections. But the problem is because you know they, they had been using movements that weren't great, uh, and they, they've been competing at price points that people think weren't worth it. A lot of the watch enthusiasts kind of wrote them off and said, oh, I'd never buy a Hublot. And they're not even giving them a second chance. So me, I'm, I'm a huge like mechanical guy. I love the internals. I love the movements and all that, the finishing. Um, and, and yeah, I probably wouldn't have bought a Hublot 15 years ago, you know, from one of those watches I made then. But nowadays, they're a totally different company. It's definitely worth looking at again. Uh, and actually forming a, a real opinion on it off like the facts mm-hmm. instead of just watching those those YouTubers just blast you blow all day and just hate on them. Uh, I, I don't think it's justified at all. That's fair. That's fair. You know what? I think to your point, it's, you know, if you're a purist and a collector, mm-hmm. you may have overlooked them. Maybe it's time to take a second look. You know, I mean, again, to your point, a lot of the watches that are now holding their value, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. I, uh, I, I my, my first luxury watch, ever was a Panerai. First one I bought myself, I should say, was a Panerai. And over the over time, I was like, ah, it's too big. I'm not, I don't like Panerai. It doesn't hold its value. 
And I've come back to that brand as I sort of take a, a mm -hmm. new look at what they're doing with forged carbon and what they've done with the Douay line, making them thinner. And so I've gotten excited about Panerai again. So maybe this is a note to all the hardcore purists out there. Take another look. Uh, Hublot is doing some cool things with their, with their materials. They've got some good movements now, which is another good thing. Again, if we're talking about investing in watches, you mentioned that in-house movement. That's a thing that is, I have noticed, important for a watch to hold its value or to, to go up in values that they have a high quality movement. Um, would you agree with that? You'd say, hey, that's, some, that's a key characteristic if you're checking off a list, that that's something you want to look for. You know, I don't really think that's like a, a key characteristic. Really? Because okay. something that a lot of people don't realize, uh, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that in-house movements aren't always in-house movements. And that sounds a little confusing, but basically brands will say, oh, this is the caliber, whatever, you know, it's our in-house caliber. What it is a lot of times is they take a movement from another company, they modify it slightly, and then they call it their in-house caliber. Uh, so, so not all in-house movements are actually fully in-house. Um, but also, for example, the, the Rolex Daytona used to use the, the Zenith El Primero movement. And those are, are just as collectible, if not more collectible, than the Daytonas with the Rolex movements. So even though it was not an in-house movement at all, those are still extremely, extremely collectible. Um, so I wouldn't say that that's really a key factor to a watch, like holding value or going up in value. Uh, it definitely can be, you know, depending on the brand, depending on the company. Um, but it, it, I wouldn't really say it's a key factor. Interesting. Okay, so you learn something new every day, right? Um, Interestingly enough, I think, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from this. So thank you for taking the time, Nick. And I also think we've come away with a few key points, right? If you're evaluating a watch as an investment, not just something you're going to wear, right? First things first, you got to love it because you are going to wear it at some point unless you're just buying to flip it, which is not what this is about. It says a watch as an investment, right? The second thing would be, hey, there's got to be the demand. It's got to be hot. People have got to be looking for it. So if you call Nick up, he says, nah, it's going to be impossible to get or it's hard to get. You know you're on the right track, right? <laughs> um, and then also it's got to be one that's got uh, a little bit uh, of a, you know, a rarity to it or it's got to be harder to get. It's got to have something going on and brand recognition. So I think you gave us some brands to look at. Chopek is one that I'm obviously now going to call you right after this and say, how, how can we find one of those? Because I want to take a look. Um, and you know, I think you've also given us a few other interesting brands to think about H Moser is another one. Um, and I think that's really cool. If you were to leave us with one watch that we should go look up right now and you think, Hey, this is a cool watch. You're going to like it. Uh, it maybe fits that criteria. Could you give us maybe one watch to go look at, whether it's a Chopic, whether it's a H Moser, whether it's even a glass, which, which watch would you say, Hey, go look at it. The H Moser Pioneer, I think, is one that's very slept on, very underrated. Um, it's starting to gain a lot more traction now, but over the past several years, it hasn't been a, a top seller. Uh, I, I think that's a really good watch to look at because it's got the rarity aspect. The whole company only makes 1,500 watches per year, and the Pioneer is a small fraction of that. Fully in-house movement, beautiful, beautiful movements, too. Um, that the case design is beautiful. The dials are breathtaking. They use a fume process. It's just gorgeous the way that the light bounces off of it. Uh, and and the, the quality and the craftsmanship is just absolutely incredible. And the leadership of the company is awesome. Um, so we, we had a, a dinner event with Edward, who's the CEO, uh, and his brother, Bertrand. Um, so we, we just met with them, had discussions, just awesome guys they're young they're really bringing a lot of like color and excitement to the watch industry um and, and the pioneer is one of those watches that we get them in every once in a while and they're actually available now usually they sell within a day or two but it's not one of those watches that you know you have to call me and, and put a deposit down and then wait three years and maybe you'll get it um it's, it's one of those watches that's attainable but it's not it's not something we we usually have in stock um, so that's a really good watch, I think, to uh, to look into. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go look it up after this. So if people want to find you on social, if they want to come, if they want to reach out to you about a watch, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so my email is nick at exquisitetimepieces.com. 
Uh, and then my my cell phone number, 239-766-7939. Um, and if you want to follow me on Instagram as well, my Instagram is just nick.lucas, L-U-K-A-S. Um, so feel free, feel free to reach out to me via phone, email, Instagram, uh, any of those. I'm always happy to help you out and find the right watch for you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say this from personal experience. Uh, Nick is exceptional at finding watches. I have put him on challenging tasks before, and he's found very hard to find watches, and he can get them for a great price. And uh, also, they treat you great when you trade in a watch to take good care of you all around. Recommend exquisite timepieces. And again, if you're looking to invest in watches, at least for the first couple of times, don't buy blind. Buy with somebody that knows the space, that knows what you're looking for, and can help guide you to the right brand and the right watch for you. And again, I, I love the guys at Exquisite Timepieces. Thank you so much, Nick, for taking the time. And again, uh, if you have not yet uh, subscribed, uh, go ahead and subscribe and like this. And I look forward to seeing all of you next time. Thanks, Nick. Cool. Absolutely. Thank you.